chapter 8. And um, what we did in the last two classes, this is class number three, what we did in the last two classes was that we did sort of a, um, a, a introduction, a preparation for what we're going to study. And what we did was we took the time to basically show what the purpose of the Gospels wasn't. <laughs> we told you what it's not. Um, we want to take this class to, to get into what it is. <clears throat> I also told you that the first class would be more academic, meaning a lot of reading and a lot of scriptures. The second class, there would be some scriptures, but we will have a little more spiritual application to it. And then when we get to the third phase of this course, uh, it'll be a little more academic, a lot of scriptures, and uh, maybe a lot of reading to cover it. And then the last phase of it is going to be, again, uh, a lot of spiritual application, a whole lot of spiritual application. <clears throat> so we've done well so far, <clears throat> and uh, now we're going to talk about the true purpose of the Gospels. And in fact, Shay, you could write that down now. <laughs> the true purpose of the Gospels. You bet. <clears throat> All right. So, um, <clears throat> so in Luke chapter 8, verse 1, let, well, before I read that, <clears throat> uh, let me just read this. So what is the true purpose of the Gospels? The purpose for the Gospels is seen in two ways. The first one is to deliver Jesus' teachings concerning the kingdom. All right, and we have Luke chapter 8 and verse 1. And it came to pass afterwards that he, speaking of Jesus, went throughout every city and village. So we're talking about every, every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the 12 were with him. Okay, so <clears throat> there is this, uh, and once we get to the, the next phase of this, we're really going to get into a bunch of scriptures, and we're going to just see how uh, prevalent this reality of the kingdom of God is in relationship to the purpose of the Gospels. Um, that's the first phase, to deliver Jesus' teachings concerning the kingdom. The second phase is to show Jesus' nature in action. This is one of the purposes for the Gospels, to show Jesus' nature in action. Okay, there will be a test. When you die. No, 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 not on paper, but as you try to live this, there will be a test. So it might be a good idea to, to get this. <clears throat> All right, to show Jesus' nature in action, how it manifests, and to see it in terms of the kingdom that God wants to come in earth as it is in heaven. That's Matthew 6.10 that Jesus said that. <clears throat> All right. Now, I will say this at this point, and that is, I have heard a lot of teaching over the years on the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? <clears throat> and I think that I'm going to be giving you a little bit different angle this time in relationship to the kingdom of God. <clears throat> but whatever that is, in, in full understanding, we can understand that Jesus asked us to pray, his disciples asked us to pray in this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. So he's talking about the kingdom coming in earth, just like it is in heaven, in earth. In other words, well, we'll get into this as we go, but in other words, the kingdom is not some future faraway thing. It's something Jesus once manifested in the earth. Okay, that's real important, real important. <clears throat> All right, so the gospel writers emphasize the kingdom of God, or put another way, the gospel writers, they emphasized the life of Christ. The gospels and the gospel writers in writing the gospels emphasize the life of Christ. Now we can say, okay, well, yeah, they emphasize the life of Christ, 
in terms of telling the history of three and a half years of ministry. That's the way most people see the Gospels. But in reality, the Gospel writers, the writers of the Gospels, were emphasizing his life, his nature, not just the history, you know, uh, they didn't. They didn't. What is the? They didn't write as biographers. They recorded things that could help us comprehend what we call the life. The life. Okay. Um, and so they emphasized the Lord's life. And, uh, and that's what God is calling for his disciples to manifest. And, you know, I thought of a couple of scriptures uh, over in, uh, let's see. Well, we read Luke, so you can just go ahead over to 1 John chapter 1. <clears throat> and this was one of the guys who wrote a gospel. But you see this here where he's talking um, in in actually an unusual way if you grasp the wording of this. This is 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. So it's 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. Right. That which was from the beginning. Okay. So he is immediately not talking about the guy that walked the earth. He's talking about what was from the beginning. And where did... Where did John, this same writer, in his gospel mark the beginning? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were made by him. So the beginning of, that's described in verse 1 is not the beginning of creation described in verse 3. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Verse 3, all things were made by him. There's, the, there's what we call the beginning, creation, our beginning, earth's beginning, what's happening with us. But what about, the, what about him before creation, before man, before sin, before failure? I'm talking about the be, true beginning out from him. The beginning is him. And all things were made by him. So John is, is um, very in tune with the Spirit of God as he writes this, that which was from the beginning, but listen to what he says then, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Of the word of life. So he's not saying, oh, we... We touched Jesus' arm. It was, it was kind of muscular a little bit. And, you, know, he's, you, know, you know, and we saw him, and he had really blue eyes, man. It was just amazing. Maybe we would have written that had we, been, had we walked with him. And, you know, we thought, hey, I think I'll write a gospel. You know what I mean? Jesus had blue eyes. Nobody ever mentioned what color of his eyes. Ever. That's crazy in light of most people and the way that they think and what's going on in their heads. I want to describe Jesus to you. And, you know, he had a halo over his head. No, he didn't. He didn't. They put, you know, it's like, why do, why do these artists put this halo over them? We want to identify which is Jesus. Folks, we need to learn to identify him beyond the externals. And they had to add that because guess what? There were no externals to truly grasp him by. There was only the Spirit of God that wanted us to comprehend that which was from the beginning we handled, we saw, we touched, we experienced. We experienced something outside of the realm of the earth, amen? Before creation, verse 3, verse 1, and all that that entails is the very reality that, that the Gospels is trying to Breathe into us that which was from the beginning. That's what we handled. That's what we saw. See, so they've taken it totally out of the realm of the earth. They've taken it out of the realm of the senses. And it's the first thing he says 
in his letters after his gospel has been written. <clears throat> okay, and, and he described it as the word of life, the word of life. And um, let's see, I, I had written here the thing that led up to this. The gospel writers emphasized the kingdom of God, or put another way, they emphasized the life of Christ because the Lord's life is what God is calling for disciples to manifest. Okay. <clears throat> Do you know that you can be a Christian and not manifest the life of Christ? Yes. Yeah. I, <laughs> apparently this side is shocked. <laughs> and these guys are well aware of that. <laughs> But um, <clears throat> it's, it's as if um, religion has begun to form our minds that <clears throat> to know the Lord is to pray, is to go to a building and have a service and get taught something, to uh, be good and all. And so far, what I've described is not necessarily Christianity. It's, it's Buddhism and Hinduism and all of them, they pray and they have a book they read and they go somewhere. And they, you know what I mean? I mean, the, the very things that I describe, most Christians go, yeah, that, yeah, that's what it's about. And you go, no, no, I, you know, and I could say, no, no, I'm talking about uh, these other religions. That's what they do. Oh, you know, oh, oh, geez. <clears throat> because ultimately it's not about those things. When we read the word, we're not as those under the old covenant. We're not just trying to obey and bring our flesh into subjection and be good. We are seeking the Lord. Jesus said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures for they are they which testify me. And then what is his word? So, so beautiful and so clearly along these lines. But you will not come to me in the word meaning that you might have life. You'll come to the scriptures. You'll come there to learn the precepts and to be good and to, to look good to everybody and all this kind of stuff. But you don't come to me in the scriptures. You're not, you, you know, we go there and we, say, we read something. We go, well, I, I get that. I understand what that says. <clears throat> But what we don't realize is that what you just read is dependent upon his life in us. I mean, couldn't Jesus come, die for our sins, go back to heaven and never come inside of us? Is that possible? Sure. Then what's the point of coming inside of us? I mean, what, really? Does he really want to be inside of us? You know? I mean, it's bad enough. He can, you know, I'm just putting it like this. He can see from up there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, to be inside of us, you know, well, he's not inside of us to, to spy on us. Well, I, I've got a closer spy cam. Jesus is inside of them, you know. You hear God talking like that or something. Well, some people think that, you know. They, they read that scripture that, you know, he, he knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. And we go, oh, oh my God. If you, yeah, if only he didn't know then, you know, he knows. He knows everything. <clears throat> but, folks, the thing that he's wanting us to know is not how bad we are. He's wanting us to know how dead we are with Christ. <laughs> you know, and when you grasp that, everything, all those hard things melt away at the cross. No, I'm not talking about a teaching and some deep truth. I'm talking about the actual encounter by revelation of the Holy Spirit that he gives you of Christ in the word and Christ crucified. And so that you begin to recognize that every part that in the New Testament that you think is a commandment, like, a, like an old covenant commandment that you're supposed to do, you realize that that is supposed to be by the life of Christ and could never be by the life of Christ unless you see that scripture through the cross. You can't. You can't. And you'll never do it. And all your attempts, you know, you'll, you can, you know, the, the bad thing about the law is it, it says, you know, there's all these commandments and it says, and if you break one of them, you've broken the whole law. You know. I mean, 
For example, if in the Old Covenant there was just a, a scripture that just a little bitty one in Deuteronomy, just you wouldn't hardly even notice it. It says, and be sure and brush your teeth every night. And you didn't do that. Then you've murdered. You've, you, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you get the big picture of how desperate that is to us. But we don't look at it like that because, you know, first of all, most of us are Gentiles, and so we don't see it in that light. But they understood, you know, I have messed up one time, and that means I've broken the whole law. <clears throat> okay. Well, that's a good thing because then you're going to have to find another way of approach with God. Amen? Another way other than you. Another way other than your goodness. Another way un other than your failures. That's because it because to the Father, to the Father, it's not about you. Well, you know that, and you'll say, "Oh, yeah, it's not about me. It's about Jesus, precious Jesus." Oh my God, I'm sure the Father just goes, "Oh, shut up," you know. <laughs> I'm sure he does, you know, because all that is rhetoric. It is not coming from the place that he wants it to come from, where you go, you know what? I, uh, I messed up once, you know, the first day of my Christian life, I messed up once and I broke the whole law and I'm guilty of the whole law. It doesn't just say you broke it, it says you're guilty of all. You're guilty of all. So you go, well, I didn't brush my teeth, so, so I probably should, you know, have to say, you know, three hail Abrahams. <clears throat> I'm mixing my metaphors here. <laughs> but it was, it was the Jewish people here. <clears throat> you know, and that's all you have to do for, for, uh, uh, for not brushing. But now I'm going to have to suffer the consequences of murder. Or all these other horrible things. All right. So now we go to the scriptures and we realize that the only thing that's going to do us any good is life, his life. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. How about Galatians 2.20? If you didn't meditate on any other part, you just meditated on this little phrase over and over not I, but Christ. Now that can only come about by the cross, right? See, <clears throat> by the revelation of the cross, the revelation that we are crucified with Christ and not the teaching and not the, the, the explaining of scriptures and whatever junk that I do that falls so short of the glory of God. But the Holy Spirit just taking that word and breathing on it. And all of a sudden you see the Lord and you, you don't see yourself. You see yourself gone and Christ as your life. And that's all you want. That's, all, that's your only hope, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you're, you're up for that. You're, you're eager for that. You're not resistant to that. You're not sitting and going, well, why do we have to die? Why can't we just be reformed? Well, try it for a while and you'll see why. You know, just try reforming your. You know, it doesn't work. <clears throat> All right, so this this thing, the gospels, this massive amount of material that covers a, a large portion of the New Testament that hardly mentions salvation truths, as we went over class one and two compared to the volume of the thing we find over and over and over and over, kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, kingdom, <clears throat> over and over. And so we find that though it looks biographical, these writers are capturing events and stories that are demonstrating a life that's different than our life. Hallelujah. They're, they're writing about life. 
and they're writing about what's not life. The Pharisees came out against him and said, well, you know, da 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 and the Sadducees came out against him, and they said this, and then even, you know, Peter, you know, Jesus is saying, you know, hey, uh, I have to go to the cross and die, and Peter's going, not so, Lord. Hmm. And the Lord's having to go, you guys don't know anything of what this is about. You're trying to save me when I'm trying to save you. <laughs> From what, Lord? You, Peter. <laughs> you know, are you, Randy? Are you, Lindsay? In fact, especially you. Do you hear that, Sharon? Do you hear that, Sharon? Do you? <clears throat> Just kidding, Mom. You don't want to get a mama bear riled up, you know what I mean? All right. All right, so for, for the gospel writers, it was extremely important to chronicle his life so disciples would not just hear the message but see how it was lived and died. All right, so you got all the epistles, and you got... Book of Acts, and you got all this stuff, and you've got all this other information, and particularly the epistles, just book after book after book, and it's giving the teaching of the reality of, of selflessness and of, you know, um, uh, there's so many of the books that were written at the latter part that give practical examples, you know, you know, husbands love your wives, and all this kind of stuff, and it's, uh, it's, it's all practical living but then in the gospels we're giving we're given the one that can live it and we're seeing him in action how he is do you understand that we're seeing him in action how he is um i'm thinking of you know john the baptist and you've heard me some of you've heard me mention this before but when i was reading it once and i, I realized it the, it says they came to jesus and he'd been feeding the multitudes and doing all this stuff all day long i mean he was out there with them in the wilderness in the heat feeding people all day long and it says uh, that they came and told him that john the baptist was dead well john the baptist was his forerunner john the baptist was also his what cousin you know in the same I mean literally in the same family and they come and tell Jesus and it says Jesus separated himself and went up into a mountain place to be alone which you know because now that's the only one you really got I mean the only one you really got in the earth he's dead and the, you got the disciples, but they're a bunch of knuckleheads. They're still trying to figure out what day of the week it is, you know what I mean? And so he goes up there into the mountain alone, and the disciples come up and they go, Lord, every man seeketh for you. They're wanting you this, and they're wanting that, and everything. And he gets up and he goes down and he heals them all, takes care of them. Okay. Well, we just go, well, he healed. See that? Did you see that? Well, yeah, he heals. He also doesn't get up and just kill everybody. He, doesn't, he also doesn't just get up and say, you selfish, self-centered, half-hearted, lukewarm, fence-riding, backslidden bunch, look at all of you. All you want is what you can get out of me and squeeze and press and push and all this kind of stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I quoting somebody's line recently? <laughs> You know, did he, have any, did he have every right to do that? Were they not truly selfish and only thinking of themselves? Yes. But Jesus gets up. And while there's healing and all that pouring out, which is wonderful, and I'm not against it, but I, I hold higher, he's pouring out selflessly. He's pouring out. And it manifests in what manner? You, we can say healing or we can say benefit to those who doesn't deserve it. That's, that's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. That's my Jesus. That's the way he is. 
and that's who lives in me. That's who lives in me. Now you get a little glimpse. That's the purpose of the Gospels, to help us to know who lives in us. To come to a recognition of the very spirit and nature of the one we say, oh, Jesus lives in me. Well, yeah, you got any proof? Well, just a, I got a little tiny halo. <laughs> you know, I got just a little one. <laughs> you know, some outward thing. We say, well, yeah, I, you know, they drew halos. We, we say, oh, well, the Lord blessed me the other day. That's proof that Jesus is with me and in me, you know. Okay, well, we're looking for halos instead of life. We're looking for halos instead of life. All right, so I'm going to read that sentence again. But, <clears throat> but the gospel writers, to them, it was extremely important to chronicle his life. So disciples would not just hear the message like in the epistles, but see how it was lived and how it was died. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Standing in the gap for us again. We've done that to him. We've hung him on the cross, and he's covering us. He's looking out for us to see how he lived and how he died. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. All right. Um, but even with the, that information, we must clarify further. The true story found in the Gospels is not just about what he did in the Gospels. Here we go. But why he did it. Not just what he did, but why he did it. Why he did those things. We must see the motive that makes up the man. You agree with that? Motive is so important with the Lord. In fact, um, look over in Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. In uh, Matthew 15, here in verse uh, 16, beginning with verse 16. <clears throat> um, in these scriptures, we can see how important motive is to Jesus. Some of you have heard me use this example, but it's, I, I use examples m many times over and over because they mean something to me. They're not just, you know, it's not just, well, Randy's gotten so old, all he's got left is the same old stories all the time. Okay, maybe they are to you. You know, honestly, maybe they are to you. But to me, they were touchstones where I met the Lord and, re and, and examples. And so, you know, however you want to see me is fine. But to me, they're genuine things. But, you know, the example that I use usually in a situation like this for motive is two doctors who, who uh, go through... Uh, all of that schooling and all of the money that they have to put into it to be doctors and they both make you know about the same grades and they do real well and everything and they both become doctors and they both become uh, wealthy and whatever but one of the doctors he said man I'm sick of being looked down on and treated the way I am. I'm going to become a doctor, and I'm going to drive a Mercedes, and I'm going to look good. I'm going to have everything that I want in a big house, and I'm going to get rich. And the other guy says, you know, well, why did you become a doctor? And he says, man, I care about people. I feel their hurt. I, I want to use my life to serve others instead of myself. Okay. And if those are true, actual true motives coming from them. All right. So we look at them and we go, you know, we, we see one doctor and we say, oh, my gosh, you know, these guys, they work long hours and da-da-da-da and all this kind of We look at this guy and go, oh, my gosh, you know, these doctors. And we just assume they're the same because they're both doing the same thing. We can't see their heart. Do you understand? We can't see their heart, but God sees their heart and God sees our heart. And he sees why we do it. And, you know... I mean, usually uh, when, when I was at this place, the Lord began to explain to me because there would be times 
when, when in my spirit where Christ dwells and Christ lives, I would want to do something to the glory of God. So, I mean, in this particular thing, I'm going to do this because I want to serve others and I want to bless, I, I want Jesus to be glorified through me and the Father to be glorified with his son. That's coming from my spirit. But my soul, at the same time, says, I want to do this, very same thing you want to do, Spirit, very same thing you, you're, you want to do, Jesus, but I want to do it because people will notice me and they'll think that I'm da-da-da-da. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't look at me so holy, people. Come on. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> and um, so I remember going through that dilemma and thinking, you know, what do I do, you know? And then I realized, well, it's real easy. You say, shut up. You know, what did, what did David say in his psalm? Be still, you know, my soul. Uh, uh, trust thou in God. And I would say to my soul, look, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it by Christ to the glory of the Father. And I'm not going to do it to satisfy you. Anybody following what I just said? So I squeeze off, I shut off, I, I, I say no to my soul, and I do it for the Lord. And I put that it's like I put that motive forward. And any time it tries to rise back up and go, hey, could I get something out of this? I just shut up and get back down. You know? And I don't give it place. I don't give it place. Okay. Well, there are other times when you're just at that time so full of the Lord, your soul isn't asking for anything, so you do it to the glory of God. There are other times when all you can feel is your soul saying, I want to I wanna do this for me. You know, well, and it's at that point you say, no, I know the truth. Christ is my life, and I will do this for the Lord. Amen? Amen. So there's three different examples in three different ways, and I'm going to try to take a little drink of this and see if I can funnel it down the far side of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it could happen. Seriously, it could happen. <clears throat> All right, so to discover motive, we must understand what Jesus' acts and actions explain to us about himself. Shall I read it again? Yes. To discover motive, we must understand what Jesus' actions explain to us about himself. In other words, we're not just looking at the actions. Yeah. We're looking at the actions to find the motive to, and to find God motive compared to fallen man motive. We, in other words, we want to know Jesus and we really want to know Jesus and we're not just reading the Bible. As, as I quoted John 5, 39, we're searching the scriptures because in them we think there's eternal life and they testify of him as that life. <coughs> and we're going to come to that word for the motive and the reason that Jesus said and asked us to in John 5, 39. All right. <clears throat> so there are two ways to look at the actions of Jesus. Two ways. In other words, reading in the Bible, reading the Gospels, there's two different ways that you can look and examine the actions of Jesus. We can study the acts themselves and try to mimic his actions. Right? Looking in the Gospel, going, well, Jesus reached down and he drew in the dirt. So, once a day, I'm going to draw in the dirt. Well, I mean, you know, I could have given you, I could have given you a super spiritual thing he did, and you say, yeah, oh, you understand what I'm saying? You know, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus by doing what he does. But by using the dirt example, you're kind of going, well, that's stupid, you know? I mean, well, I would never just run around and do the dumb things that seem meaningless. I do only purposeful things. 
Mm, no, you don't. You don't. <laughs> you don't. We tend to do what suits us, what satisfies us, what interests us. I mean, that's one, one reason why, you know, people like, you know, Mike or Patty dealing with the kids all the time, which they do all the time, all the time, all the time. I don't believe it's because they're going, you know, I'm just so into children. <laughs> Thank you, my sister. You helped me out there. <laughs> I, think, I think it's the Lord. I think it's putting the Lord first. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we, we can study acts themselves and try to mimic his actions. By doing this, we make laws that we expect everyone to copy. In other words... <laughs> You know, we see what Jesus did, and then we say, okay, you have to do that. We're not, we're not calling for Christ in you. We're calling for the action. It's a big difference, huge difference. Bless you. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the other alternative is we can behold the self-giving nature of Jesus behind his actions and ask God to form Christ in us in this way. We read the Gospels, and we're seeing Jesus. We're not seeing a story of Jesus. So important. It's, it's breathing it in instead of studying it mechanically and academically. You know, it is seeking for essence instead of uh, information concerning his external life. Somebody says, well, I want to be like Jesus. And what, basically they say, well, you know, I just want to walk around in sandals and robe and, and grow my hair long. And, and I tried that, folks. <laughs> and it really doesn't make any difference to God whether you cut your hair or not. But, uh, you know, we, we can say, okay, and, and think that this is it. He just walked around. And as we saw in the first two classes, we think he walked around sharing the gospel, and he didn't. That wasn't what was going on. That wasn't what was going on. And so, uh, let's see, the, we make laws out of them, but uh, the al uh, other alternative, we can behold the self-giving nature of Jesus behind his action and, and ask God to form that Christ in us in this way. In the last scenario, it's not the acts that are important. Not what he's doing that's important. For they are but the momentary means to demonstrate his nature. You know, that's, let's see if I can find that over in Hebrews. It's contrasting the old and the new covenant. Um, this is, uh, you don't have to turn there, this is uh, Hebrews 6.16, 6, who is made not after the law of carnal commandments, but after the power of an endless life. My God, what a statement. My God, what a statement. Made not after the law of carnal commandments, but after an endless life. 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 What life? We say endless life. That's me. That's me saved forever. That's what we get out of that, you know. I'm not under the law. I don't have to do anything right. Yeah, I've had people tell me that. You know, <clears throat> and they couldn't see be the worth of certain things because they didn't have this endless life, which is Christ, which is endlessly self-giving. They couldn't see it. So it, everything just looked like rules to them. And when a certain rule was not on their side, 
or to their benefit, it looked wrong. Now, I hope, I hope somebody heard that. When they looked at certain rules that were made and they were not on their side or to their benefit, they saw it as wrong. Well, this is just wrong. This is wrong. We had, we used to have whole guys and girls, you know, guys downstairs, girls upstairs, and we had the big shower room in there, and we had shower hours. Anybody remember shower hours? And certain time for the women, certain time for the men. And one of the men wanted, you know, he went out and he was playing and doing stuff, you know, football or something. And he was, so he came in and he wanted to get a shower. And I said, well, you can't. It's, it's the women's shower time. Well, why? That's a stupid rule, man. I just want to get a shower right now. Well, you know, first of all, there's women in there. Is that your motive? You know? <laughs> I'm just asking here, you know. And then I said, I said, do you realize that we've set this up for the benefit of the bigger picture and not just you? You know what he said? Well, you're just, you know, you're just a bad leader and you don't know how to run this place. I said, boy, that's the truth. Clearly, you are right, but the rule is not going to change, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right, so, the, so this reality of th this new covenant is not after carnal commandments. Well, then what is it after? An endless life that we all are partakers of, but do we partake of it? You know how I'm putting that? We're, we're all partakers of this endless life, but are we partaking of it? And so, you know, we see Jesus doing certain things that are totally contrary to us. And the only way to get what I'm saying right there is to start reading through the Gospels and just watch his life. All right. I'm okay, actually. Um, Jesus demonstrated the nature of his being. Now, I've tried to communicate this before. God is not ruled by a set of teachings on tables of stone or in a book. Does that make sense? That's why we call him God. And as I've said before, if there was a book or tables of stone that he guided his life after, then that would be God. Because it's higher than him. Okay. So the law of his being is the true law that is above every law. Okay. Okay. The law of his being, the law of his nature, the endless life. What is that endless life? And again, is that me living forever? No, that is him endlessly being so that he doesn't get into circumstances and, um, uh, you know, go, I wonder what I should do now. But, I mean, you follow me? I mean, we do. We're, you know, a whole lot of it's all up in here, man. It's all up in here. And what's worse, I mean, we're trying to figure it out up in here. But we've thrown a bunch of just scriptures up there. And they're bouncing around in there. And we're going, I wonder which one of these uh, I'm supposed to do right now. I mean, uh, what do I do? When I'm, I'm going crazy. I don't know what to do. No, you're already crazy if you're approaching it from that method, you know. You know, because that's crazy, because that is not what we're supposed to be doing. And all this is, you know, bouncing around, and we get all freaked out. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You live Christ. You live Christ. You let Christ live in you. You, you reckon yourself dead. I mean, this is so dear to me, it's making me cry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 
He's laughing at me over there crying, pouring out my heart. What kind of man are you, Mike? <laughs> All right. So let me just read this. We having his nature, we have his nature, right? We having his nature will most sure, surely be confronted with completely different circumstances than he, he was and need to de demonstrate other actions that fulfill his nature. Okay, do you all get what that's saying? That he had a different set of circumstances and he lived according to his being in those circumstances. We have a completely different set of circumstances. Now, if the Gospels laid out all the circumstances that we would be in, you know, well, we're going to be put on a jackass and ride into Jerusalem, and everybody's going to, we go, well, I know what to do now, you know. <laughs> and you go, you know, you walk into the temple, and somebody hands you a whip. You go, I'm with you, Lord. I'll drive these suckers out of here, you know. You know, if everything was set up exactly like Jesus, then we'd go, I know exactly what to do. That's where the frustration comes because we, go, we, say, we see that, but we look at our life and we go, well, sure, you, you know how. You're the son of God. What do I do? Well, he's your life. He's in there. And it's not about... Many times, I'll just say this, many times, folks, it's not about what you do, but the motive behind what you do. We go, well, should I do this or this? Which one can you serve the Lord in? Which one can you serve up the Lord? His, you know, his nature, his spirit. Which one can you serve up the Lord in? Well, let's see. Neither. Okay, well, then don't do either one. <laughs> Or, well, both of them, then I don't think it matters to the Lord. I mean, if, the, if, if you can reach the greater good of more people by doing this one, then if that's, if that's in your heart by Christ, then do it. If you're not that mature yet, then do this. But don't use not that mature as an excuse not to do that. Be real. Stop faking yourself out. Get with the Lord. He'll cover you, man. You know? I mean, one time I messed up royally, and I was freaking out, and I said, Lord, Lord, you got to cover me. I mean, I felt like, oh, my God, you got to cover me. And he said, well, I won't cover up for you, but I will cover you. You know what? It worked. I mean, really, what he did worked because he was my covering the whole time and I was with him. And so it really didn't, it wasn't as bad as it would have been without him as my covering, but he didn't cover up for me. <laughs> you, know, every, you know, it's always that way. You know, everything is, we think it's way worse than what it is. And we get all, and what we go through thinking about how bad it's gonna be is a hundred times worse than once you get to it and go through it. You go, oh, well, this wasn't near what I thought it was going to be. But, you know, you never hardly say that because what, you, what you've gone through is all of this freaking out and worrying and fretting and not sleeping and panicking and doing stuff to justify yourself and cover yourself and do all this stuff. So by the time you get through the whole process, the whole process, it was bad. But it wasn't that the circumstance was bad. It was all that you went put yourself through. Find what, is, what the Lord can breathe in. I don't know how to put it. You know, I mean, I know that's <laughs> ethereal, but if I spelled it out, that would still not be him. It would be a spelled out version of him. Does that make sense? You know, well, then just do this. You know, these 10 steps to successfully bringing Jesus. He's not, he, he's alive, he's being. 
the life we handled and stuff. That's what the disciples gained from the Gospels, from walking with him, from, as it were, walking in the Gospels with him. They gained that this is a being that was from the beginning before our beginning. And with, this is what we were engaged with, and this is what we began to embrace and to press past the flesh and the bone and the circumstances and the hair and the eye color and all of that and to totally so get past that that we found him. That we found him. Amen? Amen. Let's see. I know we need to quit here pretty quick. Uh, well, we can pick up at this point when we get back. So let's take a little break and uh, we'll come back in just a moment.